Thank you, Mary, so much. We are so excited to be here from Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, and we're excited to talk to everybody about um, autonomous mobile robots and how they're helping workers and, and the opportunities that are being afforded with this new technology brought, being brought in. And, but we're gonna start out with um, learning, uh, talking about what is an autonomous mobile robot. And for that, that my, my uh, teammate, CEO Jason Walker is gonna talk about that. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Patty. Um, so when we talk about autonomous mobile robots, uh, what we mean by that is that uh, it's a robot that can perceive the world. It can make decisions about what it perceives, and then it can do something to act in the world um, based on that decision that it made. And AMRs uh, do that by using onboard sensors. Um, they have a computer on board, which is the decision-making uh, capability along with all the software. Um, and then usually uh, wheels and motors are the things that uh, allow them to, to act on their decisions. Um, AMRs learn their environment by creating a map. Um, and so usually in the setup process, a person will drive the robot around and while they're driving it, uh, the robot will make a map for them. And that's the map that it uses to be able to navigate. And then while the robot's navigating, it is autonomously deciding what is the best path to go through the building and uh, can reroute and um, navigate around obstacles, uh, go down aisle six if aisle seven's blocked. Um, and, and the autonomous part of autonomous mobile robot, um, that's really what it means. It has the decision-making authority and the ability to act to achieve an objective instead of executing each individual little command. Um, something that looks kind of like that from a distance uh, is older technology called automated guided vehicles. And the guided part of that means that there's something in the physical environment that the vehicle is following. So um, that could be uh, a magnetic, magnetic strip that's um, buried in the concrete or um, some other kind of uh, navigation aid. And these AGVs can only go where those lines on the floor are already existing. And so if you need to change the direction that the robot goes, or you wanna uh, change your workflow and you need it to go a different direction. Um, AGVs are pretty much inflexible in that way. Um, they can really only do what they're currently set up to do. Okay, so that talks a little bit about what AMRs are, but how are AMRs helping workers? Um, certain ways that, that they can do this is they can reduce um, time-consuming, tedious tasks, automate loading and unloading of materials, reduce long walks, transport heavy and bulky materials, and essentially keep people safe and socially distanced. There's a lot of potential benefits for these AMRs, and so we want to go into uh, showing you some examples of these applications. So AMRs can be used uh, for the most basic task of just moving something from A to B. And that could be where a person might have been pushing a cart before they can put uh, materials onto the AMR and they can send the AMR to another destination and it'll figure out how to get there. Um, when uh, uh, So that's an example of the AMR taking instructions directly from a person and controlling it. But sometimes you also want to be able to integrate them with other machinery or software systems. Um, and so that's another way that movement can be initiated. Uh, but one of the things that's really handy is to be able to have um, the robots automatically load and unload materials. And uh, for that, we use a variety of accessories, or we call them top modules, um, to automatically load and unload the robots. And this allows the workers uh, to keep doing the things that only workers can do at each end without having to synchronize their activities with the activities of the mobile robot and having those uh, activities decoupled at the uh, at the, the beginning and end of the trip um, makes the people at each end more efficient and the robots more efficient so they can each work in their own time. And so this is an example of the Kingpin top module. It's a lift deck that can pick up and drop off totes. Um, and then another way that uh, you can accomplish that decoupled activity is to use a cart and then Kingpin can also hitch to a cart and pull it around the facility. Um, and it can carry a tote one way and uh, move a cart back going the other way. 
And that decoupling of activities um, is one of the, the key benefits uh, to, to having automatic loading and unloading. Um, there's other types of uh, material. Um, for example, um, a conveyor is a very common thing you'd find, obviously. Um, the same uh, value applies here. So uh, being able to quickly and accurately dock to a conveyor and then have the conveyor communicate with the fixed conveyor uh, to exchange the, the tote or the box or whatever the material is, um, that again decouples the activity of whatever is supplying the materials and whatever is receiving the materials as well as all of the people working around it. So. Uh, the objective is to take those um, dull, dirty, dangerous, boring tasks and, and let the robots do them. Um, the most uh, sophisticated type of top module is a mobile manipulator. And this is a collaborative robot arm combined with an autonomous mobile robot base. And uh, the best ones, like what we think we have, um, have a really complete integration of the two systems. Um, and if they're really easy to set up, then this is a robot that can get, uh, it can move in spaces and move in ways that people are already moving. And so if you wanted to, for example, automate mail delivery in a huge facility, um, this is an example of a robot that doesn't need a pickup and drop off station or a conveyor or a cart. Um, you can use all of the things that you've already been using with a person and uh, have the robot go pick up a tote full of mail and then drop it off uh, at all of the appropriate stations without having to do anything additional to the environment. So another application is heavy lift stuff um, and uh, things that forklifts have traditionally been used for. Um, we've had a lot of requests from our customers over the years to to try to reduce the, uh, the safety risks that are associated with forklifts. Um, it's kind of shocking how many injuries and deaths are related to forklifts. And it's not entirely surprising when um, the, the extremely long uh, distances that a forklift has to travel are the least interesting and most high speed uh, parts of the, of the, the job. Um, and if you can concentrate the activity of forklifts um, in uh, a certain part of the facility and you can limit pedestrian traffic in that part of the facility, then there again, you're kind of decoupling activities and you're separating um, the, uh, the people from the danger. And then you also um, have an autonomous mobile robot that doesn't blink, doesn't get bored, doesn't get distracted. Um, and it, uh, it makes the long trip through the facility. Um, and our customers are always talking about needing more people. Um, the workforce challenges are really driving all of this. And forklift drivers are a great example of a skilled worker that has a lot of valuable experience and expertise um, that are frankly hard to find and hard to retain when there's better offers. And so um, being able to uh, utilize the great team that you already have for the things that only they can do and then let uh, the Mavic or um, uh, any other uh, heavy lift robot carry the, the big items through the facility um, is a bit, big win. And uh, I'm going to steal Patty's joke. You also get a free pallet wrapper with every Mavic you buy. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good deal. Um, this following video is a case study that we did with an e-commerce company. Um, they uh, So this is a company that was already experiencing a lot of growth and needed to expand. And uh, they ship medical supplies to older folks in their homes. And um, when the pandemic hit, uh, talk about you know essential business. Um, their business was just booming. And, and we were already in the process of um, deploying a, uh, an AMR fleet in their facility. And that just really highlighted how necessary it was. So um, when they added the AMRs and the voice picking system to their facility, uh, compared with their previous method of just using manual push carts, um, they uh, were able to triple their picking efficiency um, and double the overall output of their facility uh, with a 99.9% .9 accuracy rate. And so they went from uh, being barely able to keep up 
um, to actually getting themselves in a position where they're meeting all their promises to their customers and meeting all of the demand and uh, also positioned uh, so that they can grow the company in a way they wanna grow. This is an extremely scalable solution. Um, the way it works is the voice picking system sends the robots and the people to a, a, the same destination independently. And when they meet at that location, uh, the picker gets an instruction to, uh, to pick a certain box and place it in a certain location. And then when they scan that code, the robot goes on to its next destination and the picking system sends the person to their next destination. Um, and so again, this decoupling of material movement from the things that um, humans are uniquely uh, great at doing um, is, is one of the things that makes this such a powerful um, uh, technology. Okay, so we, we talked a lot about the potential benefits and, and benefits that AMRs can offer workers, but a lot of companies are still um, reluctant to adopt and, and workers are a bit um, hesitant. And, and we, we wanna dive into this a little bit more. So, you know, we, we hear all the time um, that, and this makes sense to us, that, that workers push back when change is forced upon them. Um, and, and like everybody, kind of often feel fear the unknown. Um, when you have tools that, that aren't, they're complicated and not really made for them or with them in mind, they, they might hesitate and, and, and be fearful of the tools. Um, they, they will often, will hear that they'll often resent these outside experts that'll come in and pretend, you know, they might know the technology of the, of the robot or the automation piece, but they don't know the, the company, the, the task, the job, the, the trade, like they do, those valuable workers that have been there and, and have some such great expertise. They're gonna resent those outside experts. Um, and then they're going to naturally worry about job security. If a, a, if a complicated tool comes in and they think immediately we might get displaced um, and especially lower skilled workers might have that data even shows that that, that can happen. Um, so if, if it's a complicated tool, that's difficult to work with there. Um, you know, they, they just understandably are going to are going to resist and and um, be, be fearful of change. Um, so, so, you know, what can be done? Um, so first, it, it starts with, um, so there's two parts of it, you know, it kind of starts with the, um, the tools themselves. Um, you have to think about, we very strongly believe that um, the tools, the automation tools like AMRs need to be designed with a worker in mind from the very start. Um, we want, we're thinking of the, the, that great worker that's on the job today that knows the, the job the best. Um, so the features and functions from the ground up need to be designed um, with them to be easily deployed immediately so that they can take that, um, take it as soon as possible and, um, and, and, and embrace it and figure out how and they'll be the best people to really figure out and use their expertise and use their creativity, figure out how these tools can improve the process and the workflow. They're going to be the best people to do that. So um, making accessible um, uh, automation tools like AMRs, and, and if you can make it so you can put it in their hands immediately, um, that's going to be your best chance for people to feel comfortable immediately and to um, adopt and, and embrace, not just adopt, but really embrace the tools. And so how um, do you, so there's, the, there's the, the aspect of the of the tool itself, but then there's, okay, now how do you get them involved in, in the beginning? And so we feel like you need to un fully understand the worker's perspective and to do that, you know, have to have honest conversations and uh, about what the plans are. And, and as I said before, involve them um, from the beginning. So first you wanna explain why automation is necessary, um, how it's gonna help the company, but actually more importantly, how it's gonna help them, how it can help them um, individually and how it can be, be beneficial for, for them. Um, include the employees when uh, the, 
you know, ask the employees to help document the material handling functions. And you might be surprised, you might find things that you hadn't even thought of um, where the employees might be, uh, ha have ideas on how these tools can be used, how the mobile robots or any other kind of automation tool can be used. Um, ask them about things that are the most challenging parts of their job, both physically and even psychologically. And you're gonna learn their perspective and the, the project as a whole is going to be even that much better. Um, and then get their input as to what automation tools would improve their day to day. And then, and then to do that, um, what's really helpful is when you have vendors come in, um, you know, you want to have vendors come in, especially with AMR's newer technology. Um, and but include the workers and include your front line in those demos and have them ask questions about how it's going to work and how it's going to improve the process that they know so well. Um, and then you can have workers design tests um, based on their experience and best practices um, to and then work with the engineering team, whether that's outside team or inside team to help um, to really help them um, um, create the process with the new tools. Um, and then the testing criteria, part of the testing criteria should be how do these workers um, interact um, with the robots and how easy is it, how easy it is for them to interact with the robots. Um, so if you think about easy to use tools um, and you think about ones that, that are uh, designed for workers and you include the workers from the start, the wonderful thing about this new technology is that there's a lot of great new opportunities for um, workers of all skill levels to be involved in the automation future of the company. Um, and so we, we put together some, some um, just with AMRs specifically, how workers could be part of, um, how, how they could upskill themselves with these um, uh, tasks that will need to be done uh, for AMR. So example, um, no code programming. So an easy to use robot um, that can be set up and use visual programming tools, the workers can do this. They're able to get the robot set up from the beginning. And then likewise, um, AMRs are designed to be easily reconfigured as your workflow changes. So the workers um, could be involved in that reconfiguration. Preventative maintenance is something that you want to think about for all types of equipment and AMR is no exception. Um, so you think about inspecting the hardware, cleaning the LIDAR lenses, running software updates are all things that will need to be done when you deploy autonomous mobile robots. And then connectivity, um, keeping robots and other warehouse equipment connected, monitoring network performance, eliminating sources of interference, all are things that need to be done and that workers can do when they're involved in the process from the start. And so um, we talked a little bit about, I talked about uh, the importance of um, choosing tools that are accessible. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about some features to look for specifically for AMRs. Um, so features and functional functions, we want to find ones that enable fast setup and intuitive operation without the need of those robot, um, robotics experts. And then um, you want to look for user-friendly functionality that is going to engage the workers from the start, as I mentioned. And Jason's going to walk us through. Yeah, so uh, what to look for in a, uh, an AMR that delivers on the needs that Patty just described. Um, they need to be easy to set up. And we mean easy for the shipping and receiving clerks, the assembly line workers, the warehouse workers. It needs to be easy for them to configure and reconfigure uh, without having to go to community college. Um, it needs to make sense to them. Um, what we've uh, done to address that is um, we've built our dispatcher software as the main interface when you're setting up the robot. We tried to look at the entire user experience of setting up an autonomous mobile robot and really think of every part of it that we could improve and we could do for the users um, to make it easy to set up. And with dispatcher, there's always a big green button that's probably the thing you want to do next. And so if you pick the, the big green make map button, then you use a, a game controller, which people are familiar with, to drive the thing around like a remote control car and it makes a map for you. 
Um, and then you can uh, use Dispatcher to set up keep out zones, which are just where you want the robot not to go. And then the red dots are waypoints, which is where you want the robot to stop. And then you can make a playlist of uh, waypoints and the robot will be navigating just as fast as that. You don't have to get IT involved. Um, this is something that when we do demos at customer facilities in the old days, um, and hopefully soon, um, we always had the frontline workers involved with us. And so that's the setup process. But then on the day-to-day -day operation, it also should be easy and intuitive. And so we've made Whistle as a product that has a familiar interface. This thing works like an elevator. And the setup of Whistle happens in the background while you're doing the previous step that you just saw. So you push the come here button and just like an elevator, the robot shows up and then you can put a package on it and push another uh, button and the robot goes there. Um, so uh, a lot of the technology that we baked into our robots has intuitive usage and behavior at the heart of it. Like that's the most valuable part of it we get. And so uh, when you're setting up a mobile robot, you either have to have a robot that can um, perceive the world in a way that makes sense to someone, or you have to really educate someone a lot about how the robot sees the world. And so uh, we've given our robots 3D perception uh, so, that they're, uh, so that the robot can see the world in a similar way. And that means that um, the robot's going to do what the users expect. So it doesn't make sense to people that a sophisticated mobile robot couldn't see a pallet jack. Um, but a lot of robots can't see a pallet jack. They can't see small objects on the floor. And because of that, um, you either have to give them a lot of training uh, to know um, where to put keep out zones and what kinds of things it can't see, or you need a robot that can do that on its own. Um, and then another key thing is maneuverability. It needs to not only see the world the way we see it, but it needs to be able to move in the spaces and in the places and in the ways that people move so that when a person wants to have the robot do an activity, it's going to be able to do it in a way and in a place that they're used to seeing it done. Um, here again, if you have to explain the kinematics of a particular drivetrain, um, then you've already lost them. Um, this needs to be a tool that they can drop into their existing facility. It can uh, go into a work cell or a piece of machinery in any direction or any orientation. And it can do all of that automatically without having to, um, to have any kind of complex setup. So while these things are really cool from a robotic standpoint, the real value of it is how intuitive it makes it for the users. Um, batteries and charging are another thing that we're all kind of used to the, the burden of plugging in our cell phones every night and um, cordless drills and things like that. You know, the, the battery maintenance in our lives is something that's, that's almost a constant subtask. But when you're talking about an AMR, it, um, it's not just about convenience, it's about readiness and it's about uh, the longevity of the product um, and the expense of maintaining it. And, so we really wanted to try to take batteries and charging um, off the plates of our users. And so we came up with the end zone wireless charging system um, so that it doesn't have to be perfectly aligned. You don't have to clean the contacts and perform maintenance on them. You don't have to replace the contacts. Uh, the robot will dock itself when it's ready for a charge and it has to get close to the transmitter. Um, and if somebody walks by the robot and bumps it and it becomes a little bit misaligned, it's going to continue to transfer power and then it'll be ready to use when you get there in the morning um, and the batteries will stay healthy and uh, the organization can count on that piece of equipment with, again, out, not having to, to train your workers about batteries and charging. Um, network independence is something that uh, doesn't come up as often as it should. Um, no offense to any IT folks in the room, but anytime anybody has to involve IT, it can add a couple of weeks to your, your project. Um, and so we've built our robots to be network independent. That means all of the uh, systems, all the sensors, all the intelligence, all the data that they need is on the robot. And that means it doesn't need internet access or even local area network access to do its job. And that means that again, intuitively, a worker can get this thing, take it out of the box, set it up and start doing real work 
uh, without having to involve the IT department as soon as they get it. Um, and that's a critical differentiator. You wanna be able to get started quickly, um, but you also wanna make sure that it's scalable. And so interoperability and communication with external devices and software systems is equally critical, but it shouldn't be dependent. Nobody wants to trust their livelihood to Comcast and nobody wants to be handcuffed by a system that can't communicate with lots of different devices. And so these things are, we think, extremely important. And we hear a lot of feedback from customers of all sizes that network independence, whether it's because they've got a huge facility and it doesn't have Wi-Fi all over it, or because their corporate policies make it really onerous to get anything new on the network. Um, this is something that's really critical and uh, people need to think about it. And obviously safety is critical. Um, having any piece of equipment that isn't safe is not a win. Um, and so we've built our uh, AMRs with a three-stage safety system and our embedded system uh, has a safety kernel that was architected uh, in the same way as uh, personal transport systems. Um, the way this system works is that uh, independent of the navigation system. So the navigation system will sense obstacles, it will reroute, it will stop, slow down, steer around them. Um, in addition to that, and separate from that, there's this wrapper uh, of a three-stage safety system. And the way it works is uh, dual safety rated laser scanners uh, monitor the area close to the robot. And if uh, someone or something gets too close to the robot, um, the safety system uh, uh, overrides any software at the hardware level um, and it uh, limits the top speed to 0.2 meters per second. So it slows to a very slow rate of speed. And then if anyone or anything gets uh, within the next circle close to the robot, then the decelerate to zero uh, function kicks in. And again, at an electronic hardware level, um, the system is uh, putting on the brakes and it'll wait until the obstacle is clear. And then the third stage is the ESOP phase where uh, if necessary, power can be cut to all of the propulsion devices. Um, and, and again, this is separate and independent from um, the, uh, the navigation system. And we've architected uh, this system that's in all of our robots um, ahead of the international standards that were just released. Um, we built our robots to be compliant with those standards in anticipation of their release. So there's a lot of ways to measure ROI. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the ones that are uh, harder to quantify, but really easy to understand. Um, when you're a worker who has unique skills and talents and you feel really good when you're doing those and you're in the moment, you're in a flow state, um, you know, let's say you're rebuilding a transmission, that is a lot of expertise. It takes a lot of brain power. Um, but then let's say you have to stop that and grab a 300 pound transmission and push it across the facility. That's not fun. We've heard that directly from people who rebuild transmissions. Um, and they would love to not have to do that. It's not work they're proud of, and it's physically exhausting, uh, and it wears out their bodies. And so um, if you're thinking about one transmission remanufacturer who has to do that, and another transmission uh, manufacturer where the workers are only engaged in the work that they're most proud of, and they don't have to do that laborious, uh, interrupting uh, task, that's going to be better. If they can go home at the end of the day with more energy for their friends and families, that's better. Uh, and if they have uh, longer, more productive careers and their bodies don't wear out, all things being equal between those two companies, um, you're going to go with the one where you've got all of those benefits. And so again, those are easy to understand, but people are not used to trying to calculate them. Yeah, and, and likewise, companies, um, you know, leaders who give workers those tools, those easy to use tools, whether it's an, a, a mobile robot or any other type of automation equipment, you need to look for tools that are designed for workers and are easy for them to, to use. Um, those ones that get those exciting tools, um, the companies will have an easier time attracting people and then also retaining them as they're keeping them happier um, day to day. Um, and, and if, if you're, again, we hear this from workers, if, if they have these uh, tools 
that they feel are for them, um, that they feel that the company is willing, they're investing in those tools for the, the workers and they're, they tend to be happier with the companies and want to stay longer. Um, and then the companies themselves, they get the benefits of the automation um, that are that easy to quantify um, those benefits, but they also get a loyal, the loyalty of an empowered um, and happier workforce. Yeah, we, we hear that directly from workers. Um, there's a big difference between somebody bringing in an automation tool to displace them or it feels that way versus one that's obviously meant for them. And it shows that it, not just that automation is the future of the company, but those workers are mm -hmm. also the yeah, future of the company. All right, let's take questions. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> very okay. much. This is where I come back in. <laughs> um, all right, so we had some come into the chat and we also had some come in um, via message to me. So I'm gonna start off with the first one. Um, what basic skills should we be teaching future supply chain technicians to prepare them for working with AMRs in warehouses and manufacturing plants? Uh, basic skills. So um, I think generally speaking, any kind of computer interaction uh, activity is good. They need general exposure to computers because they're gonna interface with them no matter what. Um, the, uh, the tools that um, we've used, user experience tools that we've used in our systems, and uh, a lot of other companies have tried to use similar tools, although we think we've done it better. Um, the, uh, a lot of the, the, the uh, activities and tools that they use in STEM now in, in uh, science, technology, engineering, math education, um, a lot of the robots look a lot like those toys um, and, and those tools. And we use, a, we use a game controller, right? And so um, when we were growing up, you know, it was like, what are you gonna do with your life playing video games? And uh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna herd robots. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, I think that understanding those things, a lot of the kids who are, who are coming up um, in this, uh, in this time with those tools and exposure to them are, are going to already sort of be in a, immersed in it. Um, but I think the thing that's really great to reinforce is that it matters and that um, if they pay a little more attention during the scratch programming lesson, um, that's actually gonna pay off. Okay, we had a um, related question come in. Um, uh, Michael Galloway actually asked, does your company have any simulations that might be incorporated into college level classes? Well, we have a simulator that is uh, built for uh, integrator partners or software development partners that uh, it's basically an integration target. And so this is a simulation of our dispatcher software and it includes a 3D simulation and a virtual 3D world of a robot moving around. And we're not uh, necessarily using it for physics and, and uh, you know, for um, load balancing. The purpose of that simulator is to enable our customers to get started with integration well in advance of the robot being delivered and, and, and in parallel and be able to work out um, any new or uh, it, new integration with software um, ahead of time. So yes to simulator, um, it isn't currently something that's uh, integrated into college courses, um, but uh, we are working on that. And um, what skill sets maybe uh, could be, what skill sets are needed for software development in terms of the, the robotic software development? Is there any specific things that you recommend there? Um, well, Scratch. so, <laughs> okay. So one of the cool things about Vector, and, and it's interesting because when we were building Vector, one of my former teammates at iRobot, um, a guy named Z, started a company called Root uh, Robotics, which was later acquired by iRobot. Um, and the way Vector works is you make the map, you put down the waypoints, and then you can make a playlist. And that playlist is something everybody already understands. Um, What's cool though, is you can save the playlist as 
a program and that program is a visual programming language. So if you know what the playlist does and you can look at the visual programming language, you can kind of teach yourself how the visual programming language works, even if you haven't had exposure to it before. And then there's a third step, which is a coding interface, and it's a Python code interface. So for really advanced users, they can use the Python they already know. But if you don't know Python, you can know what a playlist looks like. You can know what a visual program looks like, and then you can see what the code looks like. And so you can almost teach yourself. And so this root um, uh, robot, this educational uh, tool that uh, that Z built this company. Um, it works the exact same way. And we did it totally in parallel. Um, and uh, and iRobot actually does have a simulator on their website. I was gonna say, I can attest to, to being able to program without having any kind of experience programming, not coming from a, a STEM background. Um, it was very easy when I started working with Waypoint to, to learn using those tools and to be able to start pro doing my own programs. Um, so yeah, I can definitely attest to the, the ease of it. Okay, so one related, sort of related question, is it really that easy to set up your and operate your robots for the end user? We think it is. Do you want to take those? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I mean, it, it, it really is. It, um, it, there, there's a big green button that kind of takes you through. Um, and then the, it, there's a lot of uh, visual cues that are showing what's happening when the map is being created. Um, and then the green, big green button to help guide you, what's the next step in the process. Um, it's very easy to get it to where it's moving from point A to B, fully autonomous, and it, with the ability to um, navigate around objects. It, it is very easy. Yeah, and, and I would, as an anecdote, um, when we go out to do demos, as I mentioned, um, I always ask who is moving the materials now and can we get them to come in for the demo and for the presentation and I I involve them I have them looking over my shoulder and if I'm really smooth I'll hand off the tablet to them um, and and they can start using it and at the end of a demo uh, I always they're they're in the room with us and with you know whatever automation engineers who might have brought us in um, and I always ask them, does this make sense? Do you feel like you know how to use it? And in the course of a you know, 20 minute setup and a one hour demo, um, the answer has always been yes. That's interesting. Okay, and we have a couple other questions coming up around safety, but before we do that, I wanna ask this question, which someone posted and I'm scrolling back up. Um, they said, do you know any techniques that human resource offices can use to help employees feel comfortable working around these autonomous robots. So kind of speaking back to the integration of um, these guys showing up on the floor with actual humans. Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of going back to what we were talking about, um, the earlier you can get people, um, the workers on the front lines to have exposure to that. And, and so that's why we very much recommend they're part of the, even the evaluation process not after the robot's been chosen and, and purchased and ordered, but as part of the evaluation process, bring them in, let them know, explain why we're, you're bringing in these tools, how it's, good, how it's useful for them, how it's gonna help them, and then hey, invite them to the vendor meetings and, and have them ask questions because they really are gonna be the best person to um, get that perspective of how it's gonna be used in their world. Um, even more than the operations manager, we believe anyway, or we hear that too from, from people that we work with. Gotcha. All right, let's address some of the uh, safety questions. There's been a bit going on in the chat around this. Um, originally, there was a question about, have are there different safety regulations for these as opposed to, uh, uh, someone posted that the, you know, the, the robotic arms used to be housing caged areas, et cetera. That was one question um, related um, or about the lowness to the ground. Do they you know, become a tripping hazard? Uh, so can you kind of revisit and, and give us a little more on safety and the regulations that, that you have to uh, adhere to or that are emerging perhaps as these emerge? Yeah, the, um, so the safety industrial robots, that that phrase, that that name usually applies to huge arms that are bolted to the floor that are incredibly powerful and they need a cage around them um, 
uh, although Veo Robotics is trying to change that, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, so uh, they are very powerful and, and they do need to be separated. Um, in recent years, um, starting with collaborative arms, which are smaller, slower, less powerful arms with torque sensing and, um, and the ability to uh, detect and prevent impacts or reduce the effects of impacts, um, the, the arms were kind of first to go into the space of um, uh, exploring the idea of this is a robot that, yeah. that is working with people in the same place, in the same space, yeah, even you know, one handing or holding for another. Um, and uh, AMRs have really turned into collaborative robots of a different sort. Um, they are, especially when you look at Vector, um, you know, it is a, it's a relatively small robot um, and it's built specifically to be able to operate in the places that people are operating. Um, and we've built a bunch of safety features into it as well as specific tools to, um, to really amplify the collaborative capabilities of it. And the mobile manipulation robot with the collaborative arm on the collaborative mobile robot. One of the cool things about that is we built in, uh, we integrated the three-stage safety system with the arm. So uh, if, um, if the robot docks to a machinery or a shelf where it's doing kitting, something like that, uh, the robot can set up a portable safety fence, basically. It sets up a uh, safety laser zone. And uh, in the same way that our three-stage safety system um, will slow down and stop if someone or something gets too close to it. Uh, if somebody approaches the mobile manipulator, say from behind while it's doing kidding, uh, the arm will stop moving and wait for them to get out of the way before it continues its job. And that's something that's already built in and it's part of what makes it easy to set up. Got you. All right, that I think answers most of the safety questions. So. Um... A couple, now one last set of questions because we're getting close to the end. Um, those omni wheels, those omni directional wheels, um, how do they handle the debris and uneven floors? Do they require extra maintenance? And then a related question what happens when it goes down? Who does the repairs? Yeah, so uh, I would encourage everybody to go to our website and check out the videos from our garbage patch. So we, we built a pen and we literally filled it full of garbage. Um, out of the trash can, um, soda cans, wires, packing materials. And uh, we've done tests with, um, with plastic pellets, such as feed stock for injection molding. So these are on the floor, these are like ball bearings basically. Um, and we put them all in the garbage patch and we made a video of the robot navigating in around over that stuff. And the mechanic wheels do great. Um, they, uh, they actually do better than other types of, uh, of propulsion systems. Um, and uh, the why of that is a long conversation, which I'm happy to have with anybody. But um, so they're actually incredibly good at um, rejecting debris. Um, I don't want to say they're perfect. There's always the magic grain of sand that's just the right size mm -hmm. to get stuck somewhere. But we've actually been really pleasantly surprised how well the mechanic wheels do. Uh, with with spitting out debris that one would think would get ingested into them. Um, and because it kind of floats over the top of debris, um, we find that uh, that it's um, it's really easy to for the robot to to maintain localization. Um, but we did design those wheels to be consumables. Um, and anybody who has anything with a wheel and doesn't design it to be consumable is crazy because they will eventually wear out. And so uh, with the HD vector, for example, there's one bolt per wheel. And so uh, you can change the wheels on a vector like a pit stop in a car race. Um, yeah, awesome. no, it's so then, then who does the repair? I think one is encouraging that preventative maintenance, which we feel that the workers can be involved with. Again, if they're brought in from the start, they can help with the preventative maintenance. And then if it, there are some, other higher level repairs, then, then it might escalate up. But I think if there's basic preventative maintenance, you can really avoid um, a lot of this high level repair. Yeah, this is that's exactly the kind of thing that um, 
that that we see future technicians and robot wranglers doing right um, if there's somebody who uh, was pushing a cart yesterday um, then they can be keeping track of three or four amrs um, in addition to whatever high skill thing they really Makes would sense. rather be doing um, and so you just have to keep an eye on the you know on the wheels the dust on the lenses that kind of thing um, and then you know do basic maintenance we did build it so that you know the 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 same user the the shipping receiving clerk the assembly line workers those are the people who can who can do that kind of maintenance. maintenance yeah well that's awesome well okay unfortunately that hour flew by and uh mm -hmm. we're, we're coming <laughs> we got a call we got to say goodbye to y'all thank you jason and patty and patty both